section thirty five of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox irish journalists by michael macdonald the most splendid testimony to the irish genius in journalism is afforded by the london press of the opening decades of the twentieth century one of the greatest newspaper organizers of modern times is lord northcliffe as the principal proprietor and guiding mind of both the times and the daily mail he directly influences public opinion from the steps of the throne and the door of the cabinet to the errand boy and the servant maid t p o'connor m p is the most popular writer on current social and political topics and so amazing in his versatility that every subject he touches is illumined by those fine qualities vision and sincerity the most renowned of political writers is j l garvin of the pall mall gazette and the observer by his leading articles he has done as much as the late joseph chamberlain by his speeches to democratize and humanize the old tory party of england the authoritative special correspondent studying at first hand all the problems which divide the nations of europe and knowing personally most of its rulers and statesmen is e j dillon of the daily telegraph and when the quarrels of nations are transferred from the chancelleries to the stricken field there is no one among the war correspondents more enterprising and intrepid in his methods or more picturesque and vivid with his pen than m h donohoe of the daily chronicle all these men are irish could there be more striking proof of the natural bent and aptitude of the irish mind for journalism dean swift was the mightiest journalist that ever stirred the sluggish soul of humanity were he alive to-day and had he at his command the enormous circulation of a great daily newspaper he would keep millions in a perpetual mental ferment such was the ferocious indignation into which he was aroused by wrong and injustice and his gift of savage ironical expression swift as a young student in trinity college dublin saw the birth of the first offspring of the irish mind in journalism the dublin newsletter made its appearance in june sixteen eighty five and was published every three or four days for the circulation of news and advertisements only one copy of the first issue of this the earliest of irish newspapers is extant it is included in the thorpe collection of tracts in the royal dublin society dated august twenty sixth sixteen eighty five it consists of a single leaf of paper printed on both sides and contains just one item of news a letter brought by the english packet from london and two local advertisements as i reverently handled it i was thrilled by the thought that from this insignificant little seed sprang the great national organ the freeman's journal the press of the united irishmen the nation of the young irelanders the united ireland of the land league the irish world and the boston pilot of the american irish and the irish independent the first halfpenny dublin morning paper and the most widely circulated of irish journals if swift did not write for the dublin newsletter he certainly wrote for the examiner a weekly miscellany published in the irish capital from seventeen ten to seventeen thirteen and the first journal that endeavoured to create public opinion in ireland it was at swift's instigation that this paper was started and he was doubtless encouraged to suggest it by the success that attended his articles in the contemporary london publication of the same name the tory examiner in which his journalistic genius was fully revealed as it has been expressively put he wrote his friends harley and st john 
into a firm grip of power and thus as in other ways contributed his share to the inauguration and maintenance of that policy which in the last four years of queen anne so materially recast the whole european situation about the same time there appeared in london the earliest forms of the periodical essay in the tatler and the spectator which exhibit the comprehensiveness of the irish temperament in writing by affording a contrast between the irish force and vehemence of swift and the irish play of kindly wit and tender pathos in the deft and dainty periods of richard steele dr charles lucas was even more than swift perhaps the precursor of that type of irish publicist and journalist of which there have been many splendid examples since then in ireland england and america lucas first started the censor a weekly journal in seventeen forty eight within two years his paper was suppressed for exciting discontent with the government and to avoid a prosecution he fled to england in seventeen sixty three the freeman's journal was established by three dublin merchants lucas who had returned from a long exile and was a member of the irish parliament contributed to it sometimes anonymously but generally over the signature of a citizen or civis the editor was henry brooks novelist poet and playwright his novel the fool of quality is still read his tragedy the earl of essex was wrongly supposed to contain a precept who rules or freeman should himself be free which led to the more famous parody of dr samuel johnson who drives fat oxen should himself be fat the object of lucas and brooke as journalists was to awaken national sentiment by teaching that ireland had an individuality of her own independently of england but they were more convinced with the assertion of the constitutional rights of the parliament of the protestant colony as against the domination of england therefore the first organ of irish nationality representative of all creeds and classes was the press the newspaper of the united irishmen which was started in dublin in seventeen ninety seven by arthur o'connor the son of a rich merchant who had made his money in london its editor was peter finnerty born of humble parentage at loray afterwards a famous parliamentary reporter for the london morning chronicle and its most famous contributor was dr william drennan the poet who first called ireland the emerald isle irishmen did not become prominently associated with american journalism until after the famine and the collapse of the young ireland movement in eighteen forty eight the journalist whom i regard as having exercised the most faithful influence on the destinies of ireland was charles gavan duffy the founder and first editor of the nation a newspaper of which it was truly and finally said that it brought a new soul into erin among its contributors who afterwards added lustre to the journalism of the united states was john mitchell in the southern citizen and the richmond inquirer he supported the south against the north in the civil war the rev abram joseph ryan who was associated with journalism in new orleans not only acted as a catholic chaplain with the confederate army but sang of its hopes and aspirations in tuneful verse serving in the army of the north was charles g halpine whose songs signed private miles o'reilly were very popular in those days of national convulsion in the united states halpine's father had edited the tory newspaper the dublin evening mail and halpine himself after the war edited the citizen of new york famous for its advocacy of reforms in civic administration perhaps the two most renowned men in irish american journalism were john boyle o'reilly of the boston pilot and patrick ford of 
the irish world o'reilly was a troop sergeant in the tenth hussars prince of wales own and during the fenian troubles of eighteen sixty six had eighty of his men ready armed and mounted to take out of island bridge barracks dublin at a given signal to aid the projected insurrection detected he was brought to trial summarily convicted and sentenced to be shot this sentence was commuted to twenty-five years penal servitude but o'reilly survived it all to become a brilliant man of letters and make the boston pilot one of the most influential irish and catholic newspapers in the united states ford who had served his apprenticeship as a compositor in the office of william lloyd garrison at boston founded the irish world in eighteen seventy this newspaper gave powerful aid to the land league a special issue of one million six hundred fifty thousand copies of the irish world was printed on january eleventh eighteen seventy nine for circulation in ireland and money to the amount of six hundred thousand dollars altogether was sent by ford to the headquarters of the agitation in dublin a journalist of a totally different kind was edwin lawrence godkin born in county wicklow the son of a presbyterian clergyman godkin in eighteen sixty five established the nation in new york as an organ of independent thought and for thirty-five years he filled a unique position standing aside from all parties sects and bodies and yet permeating them all with his sane and restraining philosophy in canada thomas d'arcy mcgee won fame as a journalist on the new era before he became even more distinguished as a parliamentarian when the history of australian journalism is written it will contain two outstanding irish names daniel henry denahi who died in eighteen sixty five was called by bulwer lytton the australian macaulay on account of his brilliant writings as critic and reviewer in the press of victoria gerald henry supple another dublin man is also remembered for his contributions to the age and the Argus of Melbourne. In India, one of the first, if not the first, English newspapers was founded by a Limerick man named Charles Johnstone, who had previously attained fame as the author of Chrysal, or The Adventures of a Guinea, and who died at Calcutta about 1800. Stirring memories of battle and adventure leaped to mind at the names of those renowned war correspondents william howard russell edmund o'donovan and james j o'kelly russell a dublin man was the first newspaper representative to accompany an army into the field he saw all the mighty engagements of the crimea alma balaclava inkerman sebastopol not from a distance of sixty or eighty miles which is the nearest that correspondents are now allowed to approach the front but at the closest quarters riding through the lines on his mule and seeing the engagements vividly so that he was able to describe them in moving detail for the readers of the times o'donovan son of dr john o'donovan the distinguished irish scholar and archaeologist was in the service of the london daily news that dashing campaigner as his famous book the merv oasis shows him to have been perished with hicks pasha's army in the sudan in november eighteen eighty three at the same time james o'kelly also of the daily news was lost in the desert trying to join the forces of the victorious sudanese under the mahdi ten years before that he had accomplished for the new york herald the equally daring and hazardous feat of joining the cuban rebels in revolt against spain he escaped the perils of the mambi land and the sudan and survived to serve ireland for many years as a nationalist member in the british parliament john augustus o'shea better known perhaps as the irish bohemian also deserves remembrance for his quarter of a century's work as special correspondent in europe 
including paris during the siege for the london standard indeed no matter to what side of journalism we turn we find irishmen filling the foremost and the highest places john thaddeus delane under whose editorship the times became for a time the most influential newspaper in the world was of irish parentage the first editor of the illustrated london news eighteen forty two one of the pioneers in the elucidation of news by means of pictures was an irishman frederick bailey among the projectors of punch and one of its earliest contributors was a king's county man joseph sterling coyne the founder of the liverpool daily post eighteen fifty five the first penny daily paper in great britain was michael joseph witty a wexford man his son edward m witty was the originator of that interesting feature of english and irish journalism the sketch of personalities and proceedings in parliament of the editors of the athenaeum for many years the leading english organ of literary criticism one of the most famous was dr john doran who was of irish parentage dodd is a familiar household word in the british parliament it is the name of the recognized guide to the careers and political opinions of lords and commons its founder was an irishman charles roger dodd who for twenty-three years was a parliamentary reporter for the times and what name sheds a brighter light on the annals of british journalism for intellectual and imaginative force than that of justin mccarthy novelist and historian as well as newspaper writer at home in ireland the name of gray is inseparably associated with the freeman's journal under the direction of dr john gray this newspaper became in the sixties and seventies the most powerful organ of public opinion in ireland and in the eighties it was raised still higher in ability and influence by his son and successor edmund dwyer gray in the south of ireland the most influential daily newspaper is the cork examiner which was founded in eighteen forty one by john francis mcguire who wrote in eighteen sixty eight the irish in america it is doubtful whether any country ever produced a more militant and able political journal than was united ireland in the stormy years during which it was edited by william o'brien as the organ of the land league the irish mood is gregarious expansive glowing and eager to keep an in intimate touch with the movements and affairs of humanity that i think is the secret of its success in journalism references madden irish periodical literature eighteen sixty seven andrews english journalism eighteen fifty five north newspaper and periodical press of the united states eighteen eighty four macdonald the reporter's gallery nineteen thirteen End of section 35. Section 36 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 36, The Irish Literary Revival by Horatio S. Kranz, Ph.D. In the closing decade of the 19th century and in the opening years of the 20th, no literary movement has awakened a livelier interest than the Irish literary revival, a movement which, by its singleness and solidarity of purpose, stood alone in a time of confused literary aims and tendencies. Movements, like individuals, have their ancestry, and that of the Irish literary revival is easily traced. It descends from Callanan and Walsh, and from the writers of 48. It is to this descent that the lines in William Butler Yeats's To Ireland in Coming Times allude. Know that I would accounted be true brother of that company who sang to sweeten Ireland's wrong, ballad and story, ran and song. 
With the passing of the mid-19th century writers, the old movement waned, and in the field of Irish letters there was, in the phrase of a famous bull, nothing stirring but stagnation. A witty critic of the period, commenting upon this unhappy state of affairs, declared that, though the love of learning in Ireland might still be, as the saying went, indestructible, it was certainly imperceptible. But after the fall of Parnell, a new spirit was stirring. Politics no longer absorbed the whole energy of the nation. Groups of men, inspired with a love of the arts, sprang up here and there. In 1890, Yeats proved himself a real prophet when he wrote, quote, A true literary consciousness, national to the center, seems gradually to be forming out of all this disguising and prettifying, this penumbra of half-culture. We are preparing, likely enough, for a new Irish literary movement, like that of 48, that will show itself in the first lull in politics. End quote. Responsive to the need of the young writers associated with Yeats, the National Literary Society was founded in Dublin in 1892, and a year later, London Irishmen, among them men already distinguished in letters, founded in the English metropolis the Irish Literary Society. From the presses in Dublin, in London, and in New York as well, books began to appear in rapid succession. Slender volumes of verse, novels, short stories, essays, plays, translations, and remakings of Irish myths and legends, all inspired by, and closely related to, the past or the present of Ireland, voicing an essentially national spirit and presenting the noblest traits of Irish life and character. Not content with the organization of two literary societies, Yeats, with courage and relentless tenacity, cast about to realize his long-cherished dream of a theatre that should embody the ideals of the revival. In Lady Gregory and in Edward Martin, an Irishman of large means, who with both pen and purse lent a willing hand, he found two ardent laborers for his vineyard. George Moore, who in the event proved a fish out of water in Ireland, Yeats and Martin contrived to lure from his London lodgings in his cosmopolitan ways, and to enlist in the theatrical enterprise. The practical knowledge of the stage, which this gifted enfant terrible of literature contributed, was doubtless of great value in the early days of the dramatic adventure, though Moore's frank thoughts, frank speech, and mordant irony brought an element of discord into Dublin literary circles, which may well have left Yeats and his associates with a feeling that they had paid too dear for a piper to whose tunes they refused to dance. Be that as it may, in 1899 Yeats's dream was measurably realized, and the Irish Literary Theatre established, to be succeeded a little later by the Irish National Theatre Society. Enough, however, of the dramatic aspect of the revival, which receives separate treatment elsewhere in these pages, as does also the dramatic work of certain of the authors considered here. From what has been already said, it should be plain that in the last decade of the last century, the ranks of the Irish literary revivalists filled rapidly, and that the movement was really under way. The Renaissance spirit took various forms. To one group of poets, the humor, pathos, and tragedy of peasant life deeply appealed, and found expression in a poetry distinctively and unmistakably national, from which a kind of pleasure could be drawn unlike anything else in other literatures. In this group, Alfred Percival Graves and Moira O'Neill cannot pass unmentioned. Who would ask anything racier in its kind than the former's Father O'Flynn? A priest we can offer a charm and variety, far renowned for learning and piety, still at advance you with idle propriety, Father O'Flynn is the flower of them all. Here's a health to you, Father O'Flynn, slancha and slancha and slancha again, powerfulest preacher and tenderest teacher, and kindliest creature, in old Donegal. Or was the homing instinct, the homesick longing for the old sod, ever more truly rendered than in Moira O'Neill's song of the Irish labourer in England? Over here in England I'm helping with the hay, and I wish I was in Ireland the live long day, weary on the English, and sorry take the wheat. Oh, Corrymeela and the blue sky over it. Do you mind me now, the song at night is martial hard to raise. The girls are heavy going here, the boys are ill to plays. When once I'm out of this working hive, tis I'll be back again. Ay, Corrymeela, 
and the same soft rain. Here, too, should be named Jane Barlow, whose poems and stories are faithful imaginative transcripts of the face of nature and the hearts of men as she knew them in Connemara. Finally, there is William Butler Yeats, who, on the whole, is the representative man of the revival. Except in the translator's sphere, his writings have given him a place in almost all the activities of this movement. As a lyric poet, he has expressed the moods of peasant and patriot, of mystic, symbolist, and quietist, and it is safe to say that in lyric poetry no one of his generation writing in English is his superior. We cannot resist the pleasure of quoting here from his Innis Free, which won the praise of Robert Louis Stevenson, and which, if not the high mark of Yeats's achievement, is still a flawless thing in its way. I will arise and go now, and go to Innis Free, and a small cabin build there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rolls will I have there, a hay for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee lloyd glad, and I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the vase of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. In this place, and for convenience sake, it may be permitted to speak of aspects of Yeats's work other than that by virtue of which he is to be classed with the group we have just considered. In his narrative poem, The Wanderings of Usheen, as well as in his plays and lyrics, he is the best of those, among whom we may mention, by the way, Dr. John Todhunter, Nora Hopper, Mrs. W. H. Chesson, and William Larminy, who have revealed to our day the strange beauty of the ancient creations of the Gaelic imagination. In prose he has written short stories, a novelette, John Sherman and Doya, and essays that reveal a subtle critical insight, and a style of beautiful finish and grace, suggestive of the style of Shelley's defense of poetry. Yeats's plays constitute a considerable and an important part of his work, but these must be reserved for treatment elsewhere in this book. In prefaces to anthologies of prose and verse of his editing, in the pages of reviews and elsewhere, he appears as the chief apologist of the aims of the literary revival, and in particular of the methods of the dramatists of the revival. Whatever he has touched, he has lifted into the realm of poetry, and this is in large measure true of his prose, which proceeds from the poet's point of view and breathes the poetic spirit. A man of rare versatility, a finished artist with a scrupulous artistic conscience, he has done work of high and sustained quality and is certain to exert a good and lasting influence upon the literature of his country. In a literary movement in the Isle of Saints, we look naturally for religious poetry, and we do not look in vain. This poetry, chiefly Catholic, has a quality of its own as distinctive as that of the writers of the group we have just left. Now it voices a naive, devoted simplicity of Christian faith. Now it attains to a high and keen spirituality. Now it is mystic and pagan. Among the religious poets, Lionel Johnson easily stands first, perhaps the Irish poet of firmest fibre and most resonant voice of his generation. A note of high courage and of spiritual triumph rings through his verse, even from the shadow of the wings of the dark angel that gives a title to one of the saddest of his poems. Often he strikes a note of genuine religious ecstasy and exaltation, rarely heard in English, as in Te Martyrum Candidatus. Ah, see the fair chivalry come, the companions of Christ, white horsemen who ride on white horses, the knights of God, they for their lord and their lover who sacrificed all save the pleasure of treading where he first trod. These through the darkness of death, the dominion of night, swept, and they woke in white places at morning tide. They saw with their eyes, and sang for the joy of the sight. They saw with their eyes, the eyes of the crucified. Among the men of the revival, no personality is stronger or more attractive than that of G. W. Russell, A.E. as he is always called, who may be regarded as the hero of George Moore's Hail and Farewell, and who alone in that gallery of wonderful pen portraits looks forth with complete amiability. He is a pantheist, a mystic, and a visionary, with what would seem a literal and living faith in many gods, though strongly prepossessed in favor of the ancient divinities of the Gael, now long since in exile. 
impressive and striking by a certain spiritual integrity, so to say, A.E. unites gifts and faculties seldom combined. He is a poet of rare subtlety, a painter in whose genius so good a judge as George Moore believed, and a most practical man of affairs, who, as assistant to Sir Horace Plunkett, held up the latter's hands in his labours on behalf of cooperative dairies and the like. His poems have their roots in a pantheism, which half reveals the secrets of an indwelling spirit, speaking alike, quote, from the dumb brown lips of earth, end quote, and from the passions of the heart of man. Of novelists, both men and women, the Irish revival can, in the words of Father O'Flynn, offer a charming variety, and among their novels and short stories are some books of high quality, and not a few, in a high degree, interesting and entertaining. To Standish O'Grady we turn for tales, with a kind of bardic afflatus about them, of the hero age of legendary Ireland, tales which drew attention to the romantic Celtic past of myth and saga, and must have been an inspiration to more than one writer of the younger generation. In contrast to the broad epic sweep and remote romantic backgrounds of O'Grady are the stories of Jane Barlow, whose genre pictures of peasant life in the west of Ireland, like her poems mentioned above, show how sympathetically she understands the ways of thinking, feeling, and acting of her humble compatriots. A like minute and faithful knowledge is evident in the work of two storytellers of the north, Seamus McManus and Shan Bullock. The former's outlook is humorous and pathetic. He tells fairy and folk tales well, and is a past master of the dialect and idiom that combine to give his old wives' yarns an honest smack of the soil. Let him who doubts it read Through the Turf Smoke or Donegal Fairy Stories. If Sean Bullock walks the same fields as Seamus McManus, he does so with a different air and with a more definite purpose. Sometimes he turns to the squireens, small farmers, or small country gentry, and lays bare the hardness and narrowness that are part of their life. Or again, in pictures whose sadness and gloom are lightened, to be sure, with humor or warmed with love, he studies the necessitous life of the poor. The squireen, the barries, and Irish pastorals are some of his representative books. In the novel, as in poetry, the ladies have worked side by side with their literary brethren. Miss Hermione Templeton, in her Darby O'Gill and elsewhere, has written pleasantly and gracefully of the fairies. In a very different vein are the novels of the collaborators Miss Somerville and Martin Ross, Miss Violet Martin, over which English and American readers have laughed as heartily as their own fellow countrymen. The experiences of an Irish R.M. remains perhaps their best book. The work of these ladies, be it said by the way, is in the line of descent from that group of older Irish novelists who wrote in the spirit of the devil-may-care gentry, the novelists from Maxwell to Lover and Lever, who were ever questing divilment and devarsion, and who in their moods of boisterous fun forgot the real Irishman, and presented in his place a caricature, him of the Celtic screech, and the exhilarating whack of the shillelagh, the famous stage Irishman who has made occasional appearances in English literature from the time of Shakespeare's Henry V on through the works of Fielding and the plays of Sheridan to the present moment of writing. Of a very different stripe from the works of the collaborating ladies just mentioned are the novels of the recently deceased Canon Sheehan, notable among them Luke Delmege and My New Curate, rambling, diffuse, and a trifle provincial from the artistic standpoint, but interesting as studies of manners, and for the pictures they afford of the priesthood of modern Ireland in the pleasantest light. If the stories of Miss Somerville and Martin Ross are related to the comic stories of the old novelists of the gentry, those of Canon Sheehan must be associated with the work of the older novelists who wrote more or less in the spirit of the peasantry, that is, with Gerald Griffin, the Bannim brothers, and William Carlton, less famous than he deserves to be by his traits and stories and a long line of novels and tales. No survey of Irish novelists, however brief, can afford to forget the Reverend James Owen Hannay, George A. Birmingham, canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral, Dublin, whose work is as distinctively Protestant in its point of view as Father Sheehan's is Catholic. 
his more substantial novels are a careful transcript of the actualities of irish life today and in them one meets incognito but easily recognizable many irishmen now prominent in literature or politics in ireland of his numerous books may be mentioned the seething pot hyacinth and northern iron finally there is george moore whose enlistment in the revival was responsible for the novel the lake and the short stories of the unfilled field and for a largely autobiographic and entirely indiscreet trilogy entitled hail and farewell the separate volumes appearing as ave sade vale and the last of them as late as nineteen fourteen george moore's anti-catholic bias is strong but his is the pen of an accomplished artist he is the storyteller's beguiling gift and he bristles with ideas which his books cleverly embody and to which the dramatic moments of his novels give point and relief not the least important work of the irish literary revival has been done by translators who have put into english the old gaelic romances and the folklore still current among the little remnant of irish-speaking country folk dr douglas hyde is in the forefront of this group he it was who organized the gaelic league a band of enthusiasts zealous for the revival of the irish language both as a spoken tongue and as the medium for a national literature and eager also to breed up a race of celtic scholars the lyrics in his love songs of connacht are full of grace tenderness and fire and indicate the kind of gems which he and his fellow laborers have added to the treasury of poetry in english but it is lady gregory especially in her cuchulain of Murthevne and gods and fighting men who more than any other has found a way to stir the blood of readers of today by the romantic hero tales of ireland from the racy idiom of the dwellers on or about her own estate in galway she happily framed a style that gave her narratives freshness novelty and a flavor of the soil upon the work of scholars she drew heavily in making her own renderings but she has justified all borrowings by breathing into her books the breath and the warmth of life and her adaptation to epic purposes of the dialect of those who still retain the expiring habit of thinking in gaelic was a real literary achievement she has indeed in sins of commission and of omission taken liberties with the old legends but this may render them not less and perhaps more delightful to the general reader however just complaints may be from the standpoint of the scholar even so brief a sketch as this may suffice to bring home to those not already aware of it a realization of the delights to be drawn from the creations of a living literary movement which is perhaps the most notable of its generation and which has gathered together a remarkable group of poets novelists and dramatists who as men and women are a most interesting company a fact to which even george moore's hail and farewell with its quick eye for defects and foibles and its ironic wit bears abundant testimony references brooke and rolston treasury of irish poetry new york and london 1900 crans william butler yeats and the irish literary revival new york and london 1904 yeats ideas of good and evil london 1903 moore hail and farewell three volumes london and new york 1912 to 1914 lady gregory our irish theatre new york and london 1913 vegan irish plays and playwrights new york 1913 yeats introduction to fairy and folk tales of the irish peasantry london 1889 representative irish tales london 1890 book of irish verse london 1895 there is much of interest though chiefly as regards the drama in the reviews beltane london and dublin 1899 to 1900 and sowen london and dublin 1901 to 1903 end of section 36 recording by owen cook in potawatomi ceded land Section 37 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 37. Irish Writers of English. By P.J. Lennox, B.A. Lit.D.
The Gaelic literature of Ireland is not only of wonderful volume and priceless worth, but is also of great antiquity, whereas the English literature of Ireland, while also of considerable extent and high value, is of comparatively modern origin. The explanation of this fact is that for more than six centuries after the Anglo-Norman invasion of 1169, the Irish language continued to be both the spoken and, with Latin, the written organ of the great mass of the Irish people, and that for nearly the whole of that period those English settlers who did not become, as the well-known phrase has it, more Irish than the Irish themselves, by adopting the native language, customs, and sentiments, were kept too busy in holding, defending, and extending their territory to devote themselves to literary pursuits. Hence we need not wonder if, leaving out of account merely technical works like Lionel Power's Treatise on Music, written in 1395, we find that the English literature of Ireland takes its comparatively humble origin late in the 16th century. For more than two centuries thereafter, owing to the fact that the native Irish, because they were Catholics, were debarred by law from an education, the writing of English remained almost exclusively in the hands of members or descendants of the Anglo-Irish colony, who, with scarcely an exception, were Protestants and had as their principal Irish seat of learning the then essentially Protestant institution Trinity College Dublin. Alien in race and creed though these writers mainly were, they have nevertheless spread a halo of glory around their adopted country, and have won the admiration, and often the affection, of Irishmen of every shade of religious and political belief. For example, there is no Irishman who is not proud of Molyneux and Swift, of Goldsmith and Burke, of Grattan and Sheridan. From the 19th century onward, Irish Catholics have taken their full share in the production of English literature. Here, however, it will be necessary to consider the writers of none but the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, as in other pages of this volume considerable attention has been given to those of later date. 1. Sixteenth Century Richard Stanihurst, 1547-1618, born in Dublin but educated at Oxford, is the first representative of the sixteenth century with whom we are called upon to deal. He belonged to a family long settled in or near Dublin, and of some note in municipal annals. Under the direction of the Jesuit martyr Edmund Campion, Stanahurst wrote a description, as well as a portion of the history, of Ireland for Hollinshead's Chronicles, published in 1577. He also translated, 1582, the first four books of Virgil his Aeneas into quantitative hexameters, on the unsound pedantic principles which Gabriel Harvey was at that time trying so hard to establish in English prosody. But the experiment, which turned out so badly in the master's hands, fared even worse in those of the disciple, and Stanhurst's lines will always stand as a noted specimen of inept translation and ridiculous versification. Equally inartistic was his version of some of the psalms in the same metre. In Latin, he wrote a profound commentary on Porphyry, the Neoplatonic mystic. Stanahurst, who was uncle to James Usher, the celebrated Protestant Archbishop of Armagh, was himself a convert to Catholicity, and on the death of his second wife became a priest, and wrote in Latin some edifying books of devotion. Two of his sons joined the Jesuit order. He died at Brussels in 1618. Stanahurst viewed Ireland entirely from the English standpoint, and in his description and history, is, consciously or unconsciously, greatly biased against the native race. If we may take it as certain that modern investigation is correct in asserting that Thomas Campion was a native of Dublin, a notable addition will have been made to the ranks of Irish-born writers of English at this period. Thomas Campion, 1567-1620, wherever born, spent most of his life in London. He was a versatile genius, for after studying law he took up medicine, and although practicing as a physician, he yet found time to write four masks and many lyrics, and to compose a goodly quantity of music. Some of his songs appeared as early as 1591. Among his works is a treatise entitled Observations in the Art of English Poesy, 1602, in which, strange to say, he, a born lyrist, advocated unrhymed verse and quantitative measures, but fortunately his practice did not usually square with his theory. His masks were written for occasions, such as the marriage of Lord Hayes, 1607, the nuptials of Princess Elizabeth and the Elector Palatine, 1613, 
and the ill-starred wedding of Somerset and the quondam Countess of Essex in the same year. In these masks are embedded some of his best songs. Others of his lyrics appeared in several books of airs between 1601 and 1670. Many of them were written to music, sometimes music of his composing. Such dainty things as Now hath Flora robbed her bowers, and Hark all ye ladies that do sleep, possess the charms of freshness and spontaneity, and his devotional poetry, especially Awake, Awake, Thou Heavy Sprite, and Never Weather-Beaten Sail, More Willing Bent to Shore, makes almost as wide an appeal. 2. 17th Century Passing by with regret the illustrious 17th century names of Philip O'Sullivan Bear, Sir James Ware, Luke Wadding, Hugh Ward, John Colgan, and John Lynch, because their bearers wrote in Latin, and those of the Four Masters and Geoffrey Keating, because they wrote in Irish, we are first brought to a pause in the 17th century by the imposing figure of him whom, in a later day, Johnson justly called the, quote, great luminary of the Irish Protestant Church, end quote, none other than the Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of Ireland, James Usher himself. James Usher, 1581 to 1656, born in Dublin and among the earliest students of the newly founded Trinity College, was in intellect and scholarship one of the greatest men that Ireland has ever produced. Selden describes him as learned to a miracle, ad miraculum doctus, and Canon Dalton, in his History of Ireland, says of him that, quote, he was not unworthy to rank even with Dunce Scotus, and when he died he left in his own church neither an equal nor a second, end quote. Declining the high office of Provost of Trinity, Usher was made Bishop of Meath, and was afterwards promoted to the Primatial See. His fine intellect was unfortunately marred by narrow religious views, and in many ways he displayed his animus against those of his countrymen who did not see eye to eye with him in matters of faith and doctrine. For example, it was he who in 1626 drew up the Irish Protestant bishop's protest against toleration for Catholics therein showing a bigotry which consorted badly with his reputation as a scholar. On account of his well-known attitude towards Catholicism, he was naturally unpopular with those who professed the ancient creed, and hence, when the rebellion of 1641 broke out, much of his property was destroyed by the enraged insurgents. His person escaped violence, for he happened to be in England at the time, engaged in the vain task of trying to effect an accommodation between Charles I and the English Parliament. He never returned to his see, and died in London. Usher's collected works fill seventeen stately volumes. His magnum opus is undoubtedly the Annales Veteris et Novi Testamenti. It is written in Latin, and is a chronological compendium of the history of the world from the creation to the dispersion of the Jews under Vespasian. Published at Leiden, London, Paris, and Oxford, it gained for its author a European fame. His books written in English deal mostly with theological or controversial subjects, and while they display wide reading, great acumen, and keen powers of argumentation, they yet do not do full justice to his genius. Those which he published in Dublin are A Discourse of the Religion Anciently Professed by the Irish and British, 1622, in which he tried to show that the ritual and discipline of the Church, as originally established in the British Isles, were in agreement with the Church of England, and opposed to the Catholic Church on the matters in dispute between them. An answer to a challenge made by a Jesuit in Ireland, 1624, in which his aim was to disprove the contention set forth earlier in the same year by a Jesuit that uniformity of doctrine had always been maintained by the Catholic Church, and Emmanuel, or the Mystery of the Incarnation. He published in England The Original of Bishops, A Body of Divinity, the principles of Christian religion, and other works. So great was Usher's reputation that when he died, Cromwell relaxed in his favour one of the strictest laws of the Puritans, and allowed him to be buried with the full service of the Church of England, and with great pomp, in Westminster Abbey. Among Usher's other claims to distinction, it should be noted that it was he who, in 1621, discovered the celebrated Book of Kells, which had long been lost. 
this marvel of the illuminator's art passed with the remainder of his collection of books and manuscripts to trinity college dublin in sixteen sixty one and to this day it remains one of the most treasured possessions of the noble library of that institution sir john denham sixteen fifteen to sixteen sixty nine a dublin man by birth took an active part on the side of charles i against the parliament during the civil war and subsequently was conspicuous in the intrigues that led to the restoration of charles the second in his own day he had a great reputation as a poet his tragedy the sophie and his translation of the psalms are now forgotten but he is still well remembered for one piece cooper's hill in which occur the well-known lines addressed to the river thames oh could i flow like thee and make thy stream my great example as it is my theme though deep yet clear though gentle yet not dull strong without rage without o'erflowing full another dublin-born man was wentworth dillon earl of roscommon sixteen thirty three to sixteen eighty four he had the good fortune to win encomiums both from dryden and from pope one of his merits as pointed out by the latter is that in all charles's days roscommon only boasts unspotted bays he translated from Virgil, Lucan, Horace, and Guarini, wrote prologues, epilogues, and other occasional verses, but is now principally remembered for his poetical essay on translated verse, 1681, in which he develops principles previously laid down by Cowley and Denham. To his credit, be it said, he condemns indecency, both as want of sense and as bad taste. He was honoured with a funeral in Westminster Abbey. Johnson records that, at the moment of his death, Roscommon uttered with great energy and devotion the following two lines from his own translation of the Dies Irae. My God, my Father, and my Friend, do not forsake me in my end. Robert Boyle, 1627 to 1691, one of the great founders of the Royal Society, 1662, was the son of the great Earl of Cork, and was born at Lismore, County Waterford. He takes rank among the principal experimental philosophers of his age, and he certainly rendered valuable services to the advancement of science. Most of his writings, which are very voluminous, are naturally of a technical character, and therefore do not belong to literature. But his occasional reflections on several subjects, 1665, a strange mixture of triviality and seriousness, was germinal in this sense that it led to two celebrated jeux d'esprit, namely Butler's occasional reflection on Dr. Charlton's feeling a dog's pulse at Gresham College, and Swift's pious meditation upon a broomstick, in the style of the Honourable Mr. Boyle. Indeed, one of Boyle's reflections, that upon the eating of oysters, is reputed to have rendered a still more signal service to literature, for in its two concluding paragraphs is contained the idea which, under the transforming hand of the master satirist, eventually took the world by storm when it appeared, fully developed, as Gulliver's Travels. His brother, Roger Boyle, 1621 to 1679, who figures largely as a soldier and statesman in Irish and English history under his title of Lord Brawhill, was an alumnus of Trinity College, Dublin. During the Civil War, he was a royalist until the death of Charles I, when he changed sides and aided Cromwell materially in his Irish campaign. When the Lord Protector died, Brawhill made another right-about face, and, crossing to his native country, worked so energetically and successfully that he made Ireland solid for the restoration of Charles II. For this service, he was rewarded by being created Earl of Orrery. He was the author of six tragedies and two comedies, some of which, when produced, proved gratifyingly popular. He is noted for having been the first to write tragedy in rhyme, thereby setting an example that was followed with avidity, for a time, by Dryden and others. He also wrote poems, a romance called Parthenissa, 1654, and a treatise on the art of war, 1677. From whatever point of view considered, Lord Orrery was a remarkable member of a remarkable family. His son, John Boyle, Earl of Cork and Orrery, 1707 to 1762, in virtue of his translation of Pliny's letters, his remarks on the life and writings of Swift, and his letters from Italy, has some claims to recognition in the field of literature. 
Charles Leslie, 1650 to 1722, a Dubliner by birth, was son of that John Leslie, Bishop of Raffaux and Clotter, who lived through a whole century, from 1571 to 1671, and who was 79 years of age when Charles, his sixth son, was born. Educated first at Enniskillen, and afterwards at Trinity College, Dublin, Charles Leslie studied law in London, but eventually abandoned that profession and entered the ministry. He was of a disputatious character, and in particular went to great lengths in opposing the pro-Catholic activities of James the Second. Nevertheless, when the revolution of 1688 came, he took the side of the deposed monarch, and loyally adhered to his Jacobite principles for the remainder of his life. He eventually joined the old pretender on the continent, and endeavored to convert him to Protestantism, but failing therein, he returned to Ireland, where he died at Glasloch in County Monaghan. Many years of Leslie's life were devoted to disputes with Catholics, Quakers, Socinians, and Deists, and the seven volumes which his writings fill prove that he was an extremely able controversialist. His best-known work is the famous treatise, A Short and Easy Method with the Deists, published in 1698. The Irish note, tone, or temper is not conspicuous in any of the writings so far named, unless when it is conspicuous by its absence but it appears plainly for the first time in Molyneux's Case of Ireland Being Bound by Laws Made in England, stated, 1698. William Molyneux has always ranked as an Irish patriot. His was one of the spirits invoked by Grattan in his great speech, 1782, on the occasion on which he carried his celebrated Declaration of Independence in the Irish Parliament. When the English Act of 1698, which was meant to destroy, and did destroy, the Irish woolen industry came before the Irish House of Commons for ratification, Molyneux's was the only voice raised against its adoption. His protest was followed by the publication of his case stated, which is a classic on the general relations between Ireland and England, and contained arguments so irrefutable that it drove the English Parliament to fury, and was by that body ordered to be burned by the common hangman. It is a remarkable coincidence that Molyneux opens his argument by laying down, in almost identical words, the principles which stand at the beginning of the American Declaration of Independence. John Toland, 1669-1722, was born near Redcastle in County Derry, and was at first a Catholic, but subsequently became a freethinker. His Christianity Not Mysterious, 1696, marks an epoch in religious disputes, for it started the deistical controversy, which was so distinctive a feature of the first half of the 18th century. It shared a similar fate to that of the case stated, though on very different grounds, and was ordered by the Irish Parliament to be burned by the hangman. Toland wrote many other books, among which are Amintor, 1699, Nazarenus, 1702, Pantheisticon, History of the Druids, and Hypatia. All his books show versatility and wide reading, and are characterized by a pointed, vigorous, and aggressive style. George Farquhar, 1678-1707, a dairyman, and Thomas Southern, 1660-1746, born near Dublin, were distinguished playwrights who began their respective careers in the 17th century. Farquhar left Trinity College Dublin as an undergraduate and became an actor, but owing to his accidental killing of another player, he left the stage and secured a commission in the army. He soon turned his attention to the writing of plays, and was responsible in all for eight comedies. He has left us some characters that are very humorous, and at the same time true to life, such as Scrub the Servant in The Bow's Stratagem, and Sergeant Kite in The Recruiting Officer. His Boniface, the landlord in the former of these two plays, has become the type, as well as the ordinary quasi-facetious nickname, of an innkeeper. He was advancing in his art, for his last comedy, The Bow's Stratagem, 1707, is undoubtedly his best, and had he lived longer, he died before he was thirty, he might have bequeathed to posterity something even more noteworthy. As Lee Hunt says of him, quote, he was becoming gayer and gayer, when death, in the shape of a sore anxiety, called him away as if from a pleasant party, and left the house ringing with his jest. End quote. Southern was also a student of Trinity College, Dublin. 
At the age of eighteen, however, he left his alma mater and went to London to study law. This profession he in turn abandoned for the drama. His first play, The Persian Prince of the Loyal Brother, had a remarkable success when performed and secured him an ensign's commission in the army, 1685. Here promotion came to him rapidly, and by 1688 he had risen to captain's rank. The revolution of that year, however, cut off all further hope of advancement, and he once more turned his attention to the writing of plays. His productions, number 10. His tragedies Isabella, or The Fatal Marriage, 1694, and Arunico, 1696, both founded on tales by Mrs. Aphra Bain, are powerful presentations of human suffering. His comedies are amusing but gross. Southern had business ability enough to make playwriting pay, and the amounts he received for his productions fairly staggered his friend Dryden. It is to this faculty that Pope alludes when he says that Southern was one whom heaven sent down to raise the price of prologues and of plays. He was apparently of amiable and estimable character, for he secured and retained the friendship not only of Dryden, a comparatively easy matter, but also that of Pope, a much more difficult task. Known as the poet's nester, Southern spent his declining years in peaceful retirement and in the enjoyment of the fortune which he had amassed by his pen. Nahum Tate, 1652 to 1715, a Dubliner by birth, and Nicholas Brady, 1659 to 1726, a banded man, have secured a certain sort of twin immortality by their authorized metrical version of the Psalms, 1696, which gradually took the place of the older rendering by Sternhold and Hopkins. Tate became Poet Laureate in 1690, in succession to Shadwell, and was appointed Historiographer Royal in 1702. He wrote the bulk of the second part of Absalom and Achitophel, with a wonderfully close imitation of Dryden's manner, besides several dramatic pieces and poems. Between Tate, Shadwell, Usedon, and Pye lies the unenviable distinction of being the worst of the laureates of England. Brady was a clergyman who, after the pleasant fashion of that day, was a pluralist on a small scale, for he had the living of Richmond for thirty years from 1696, and while holding that, held also in succession the livings of Stratford-on-Avon and Clapham. He added further to his income, and doubtless to his anxieties, by keeping a school at Richmond. He wrote a tragedy entitled The Rape, A History of the Goths and Vandals, a translation of the Aeneid into blank verse, and an ode for St. Cecilia's Day, but unless for his share in the version of the Psalms, his literary reputation is well nigh as dead as the dodo. Ireland somewhat doubtfully claims to have given birth to Mrs. Susanna Saint-Livre, circa 1667 to 1723, who, after a rather wild youth, set down to literary pursuits and domestic contentment, when in 1706 she married Queen Anne's head cook, Joseph Saint-Livre, with whom she lived happily ever after. Her first play, The Provoked Husband, a tragedy, was produced in 1700, and then she went on the stage as an actress. She wrote in all 19 dramatic pieces, some of which had the honour of being translated into French and German. Her most original play was A Bold Stroke for a Wife, 1717. End of section 37. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi, Ceded Land. Section 38 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Writers of English, Part 2, by P. J. Lennox, B. A. Lit. D. 18th Century. We have now fairly crossed the border of the 18th century, and as we met Usher early in the 17th, so we are here confronted with the colossal intellect and impressive personality of Swift, one of the greatest, most peculiar, and most original geniuses to be found in the whole domain of English literature. Jonathan Swift, 1667-1745, to born in Dublin, 
was educated at Trinity College, where he succeeded in graduating only by special favor. After some years spent in the household of Sir William Temple in England, he entered the ministry of the Irish Church. During the early years of the century he spent much time in London, and took an active part in bringing about that political revolution which seated the Tories firmly in power during the last four years of the reign of Queen Anne. His services in that connection on the Examiner newspaper were so great that it would be difficult to dispute the assertion, which has been made, that he was one of the mightiest journalists that ever wielded a pen. He also stood loyally by his party in his great pamphlets, The Conduct of the Allies, 1711, The Barrier Treaty, 1712, and The Public Spirit of the Whigs, 1714. When the time came for his reward, he received not, as he had hoped, an English bishopric, but the deanery of St. Patrick's in Dublin. On resuming his residence in Ireland, he was at first very unpopular, but his patriotic spirit, as shown in the Drapier Letters, 1723 to 1724, written in connection with a coinage scheme known as Wood's Halfpence, not only caused the withdrawal of the obnoxious project, but also made Swift the idol of all classes of his countrymen. In many others of his writings he showed that pro-Irish leaning which caused Grattan to invoke his spirit along with that of Molneux on the occasion already referred to. Nothing more mordant than the irony contained in his modest proposal has ever been penned. In his plea for native manufactures he struck a keynote that has vibrated down the ages when he advised Irishmen to burn everything English except coal. Swift's greater works are The Battle of the Books, his contribution to the controversy concerning the relative merits of the ancients and the moderns, The Tale of a Tub, in which he attacked the three leading forms of Christianity, and above all Gulliver's Travels. In this last work he let loose the full flood of his merciless satire and lashed the folly and vices of mankind in the most unsparing way. He also wrote verses which are highly characteristic, and some of them not without considerable merit. His life was unhappy, and for the last five years of it he was to all intents and purposes insane. His relations with Stella, Hester Johnson, and Vanessa, Esther, Van Roaming, have never been quite satisfactorily explained. The weight of evidence would seem to show that he was secretly married to Stella, but that they never lived together as husband and wife. Many novels and plays have been written round those entanglements. He lies buried in his own cathedral, St. Patrick's, Dublin, and beside him lies Stella. Over his tomb there is an epitaph in Latin, written by himself, in which, after speaking of the seva indignatio which tore his heart, he bids the wayfarer to go and imitate, if he can, the energetic defender of his native land. Contemporary with the dean there was another Anglo-Irishman, who fills a large space in the history of English literature, and of whom his countrymen are justly proud. Sir Richard Steele, 1672 to 1729, who was born in Dublin and educated at the Charterhouse in London and afterwards at Oxford, started the Tatler in 1709, and thereby popularized, though he did not exactly originate, the periodical essay. Aided by his friend Addison, he carried the work to perfection in The Spectator, 1711 to 1712, and The Guardian, 1713. Since then, these essays have enlightened and amused each succeeding generation. Of the two, Addison's is the greater name, but Steele was the more innovating spirit, for it is to him, and not to Addison, that the conception and initiation of the plan of the celebrated papers is due. Steele had had a predecessor in Defoe, whose review had been in existence since 1704, but the more airy graces which characterized the Tatler and the Spectator gave the lucubrations of Isaac Bickerstaff and of Mr. Spectator, a greater hold on the public than Defoe's paper was ever able to establish. Steele was responsible for many more periodicals, such as The Englishman, The Lover, The Reader, Town Talk, The Tea Table, Chit Chat, The Plebeian, and The Theatre, most of which had a rather ephemeral existence. Among his other services to literature, he helped to purify the stage of some of its grossness, and he became the founder of that sentimental comedy which in the days of the early Georges took the place of the immoral comedy of the Restoration period, when, in Johnson's famous phrase, intrigue was plot, obscenity was wit. Steele's four comedies are The Funeral, 
or Grief a la Mode, 1701, The Lying Lover, 1703, The Tender Husband, 1705, and The Conscious Lovers, 1722. Although he held various lucrative offices, Steele was never really prosperous and was frequently in debt. Like most of the contemporary Englishmen with whom his lot was thrown, he was rather addicted to the bottle. But on the whole, it may fairly be advanced that unnecessary stress has been laid on these aspects of his life by Macaulay, Thackeray, and others. After a checkered career, he died near Carmarthen in Wales on September 1, 1729 member of a family and bearer of a name destined to secure immense fame in later irish history thomas parnell sixteen seventy nine to seventeen eighteen was born in dublin and educated at trinity college entering the ministry in seventeen hundred he was rapidly promoted to be archdeacon of clower and some years later he was made rector of finglas an accomplished scholar and a delightful companion he was one of the original members of the famous scribblerus club and wrote or helped to write several of its papers he contributed to the spectator and the guardian and he rendered sterling assistance to pope in the translation of homer as will be inferred he spent much of his time in england and on one of his journeys to ireland he died in his thirty-ninth year at chester where he was buried he wrote a great deal of verse songs hymns epistles eclogues translations tales and occasional trifles but three poems a hymn to contentment which is fanciful and melodious a night piece on death in which inquisitorial research seems to have found the first faint dawn of romanticism and the hermit which has not been inaptly styled the apex and chef de of augustan poetry in england constitute his chief claim to present remembrance francis hutcheson sixteen ninety four to seventeen forty six the son of a presbyterian minister was born at armagh and studied at glasgow university he opened in dublin a private academy which succeeded beyond expectation the publication of his inquiry into the original of our ideas of beauty and virtue seventeen twenty and his essay on the nature and conduct of the passions seventeen twenty eight brought him great fame and in seventeen twenty nine he was elected to the professorship of moral philosophy in the university of glasgow others of his works are a treatise on logic and a system of moral philosophy the latter not published till seventeen fifty five nine years after his death hutcheson fills a large space in the history of philosophy both as a metaphysician and as a moralist he is in some respects a pioneer of the scotch school and of common sense philosophy he greatly developed the doctrine of moral sense a term first used by the third earl of shaftesbury indeed much of his whole moral system may be traced to shaftesbury hutcheson's influence was widely felt it is plainly perceptible in hume adam smith and reed he was greater as a speaker even than as a writer and his lectures evoked much enthusiasm george berkeley sixteen eighty five to seventeen fifty three bishop of cloyne was born at dysart castle near thomastown county kilkenny and was educated first at kilkenny school and afterwards at trinity college dublin having taken anglican orders he visited london where he wrote nine papers for the guardian and was admitted to the companionship and friendship of the leading literary men of the age swift pope addison steele and arbuthnot this connection proved of great assistance to him for pope not only celebrated him as possessing every virtue under heaven but also recommended him to the duke of grafton lord lieutenant of ireland who appointed him his chaplain and subsequently obtained for him the deanery of derry in furtherance of a great scheme for converting the savage americans to christianity berkeley and some friends armed with a royal charter came to this country landing at newport in rhode island in january seventeen twenty nine all went well for a while berkeley bought a farm and built a house but when the hard-hearted prime minister refused to forward the twenty thousand pounds which had been promised the project came to an end and berkeley returned to london in february seventeen thirty two in seventeen thirty four he was appointed bishop of cloyne and later refused the see of clower though its income was fully double that of his own diocese in seventeen fifty two he resigned his bishopric and settled at oxford where he died in 1753. Berkeley's works are very numerous. His Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision, 1709, which was long regarded in the light of a philosophical romance, 
in reality contains speculations which have been incorporated in modern scientific optics in his three dialogues between hylas and philonius seventeen thirteen he sets forth his famous demonstration of the immateriality of the external world of the spiritual nature of the soul and of the all-ruling and direct providence of god his tenets on immateriality have always been rejected by common-sense philosophers but it should be remembered that the whole work was written at a time when the english-speaking world was disturbed by the theories of skeptics and deists whose doctrines the pious divine sought as best he could to confute in seventeen thirty two appeared his alciferon or the minute philosopher in which dialogue wise he presents nature from a religious point of view and in particular gives many pleasing pictures of american scenery and life these dialogues have frequently been compared to the dialogues of plato to berkeley's credit be it said that while he ruled in cloyne he devoted much thought to the amelioration of conditions in his native land many acute suggestions in that direction are found in the queerest seventeen thirty five to seventeen thirty seven by some extraordinary ratiocinative process he convinced himself that tar water was a panacea for human ills and in seventeen forty four he set forth his views on that subject in the tract called cirrus and returned to the charge in seventeen fifty two in his further thoughts on tar water whatever may be thought of the value of berkeley's philosophical or practical speculations there is only one opinion of his style it is distinguished by lucidity ease and charm it has the saving grace of humor and it is shot through with imagination taken all in all this eighteenth century bishop is a notable figure in literary annals charles macklin circa sixteen ninety seven to seventeen ninety seven whose real name was mclaughlin was a westmeath man who took to the stage in early life and remained on the boards with considerable and undiminished reputation for some seventy years not retiring until seventeen eighty nine when he was at least ninety two years old to him we are indebted for what is now the accepted presentation of the character of shylock in the merchant of venice he wrote a tragedy and many comedies and farces those by which he is now best remembered are the farce love a la mode seventeen sixty and his masterpiece the farcical comedy the man of the world seventeen sixty four in sir pertinax mac sycophant macklin has given us one of the traditional burlesque characters of the english stage thomas armory sixteen ninety one to seventeen eighty eight if not born in ireland was at least of irish descent and was educated in dublin he is known in literature for two books the first with the very mixed title of memoirs containing the lives of several ladies of great britain a history of antiquities observations on the christian religion was published in seventeen fifty five and the second the life of john bungle esq came out in two volumes in seventeen fifty six to seventeen sixty six it appears to have been the author's aim in both works to give us a hotchpotch in which he discourses de omnibus rebus et quibustam ailis we have dissertations on the cause of earthquakes and of muscular motion on the athanasian creed on fluxions on phlogiston on the physical cause of the deluge on irish literature on the origin of language on the evidences for christianity and on all other sorts of unrelated topics hazlitt thought the soul of rabelais had passed into armory while a more recent critic can see in his long-winded discussions naught but the light-headed ramblings of delirium if we try to read john buncle consecutively the result is boredom but if we open the book at random we are pretty sure to be interested and even sometimes agreeably entertained the bizarre figure of lawrence stern seventeen thirteen to seventeen sixty eight next claims our attention the son of a captain in the british army he was born at clonmel county tipperary of him almost more than any of the other writers so far dealt with it may be said that he was irish only by the accident of birth his parents were english on both sides and practically the whole life of their son was spent out of ireland he was sent to school at halifax in yorkshire and thence went on to cambridge university where he graduated in due season taking anglican orders in seventeen thirty eight he was immediately appointed to the benefice of sutton in the forest near york and on his marriage in seventeen forty one with elizabeth lumley he received the additional living of stillington he was also given sundry prebendal and other appointments in connection with the chapter of the archdiocese of york 
he spent nearly twenty years in the discharge of his not very onerous duties and in reading painting shooting and fiddling without showing the least sign of any literary leanings then suddenly in seventeen sixty he took the world by storm with the first two volumes of tristram shandy he at once became the lion of the hour was feted and dined to his heart's content and had his nostrils tickled with the daily incense of praise from his numerous worshippers he repeated the experiment with equal success in the following year with two more volumes of tristram and so at intervals until seventeen sixty seven when he published the ninth and last volume of this most peculiar story in seventeen sixty eight he brought out a sentimental journey and within three weeks he died in his lodgings in london his other publications include sermons and letters tristram shandy is unique in english literature it stands sui generis for all time there is scarcely any consecutive narrative and what there is is used merely as a peg on which to hang endless digressions but while there are many faults of taste and morals there are also genuine humor and pathos and without walter shandy dr slop the widow wadman yorick uncle toby and corporal trim english literature would certainly be very much the poorer hugh kelly seventeen thirty nine to seventeen seventy seven born in dublin was the son of a publican and himself became a staymaker a trade from which he developed through the successive stages of attorney's clerk newspaper writer theatrical critic and essayist into a novelist and playwright his novel memoirs of a magdalen seventeen sixty seven was translated into french his first comedy a sentimental one entitled false delicacy seventeen sixty eight achieved a remarkable success on the stage and was even a greater success in book form ten thousand copies being sold in a year so that its author was raised from poverty to comparative affluence in addition it gave him a european reputation for it was translated into german french and portuguese strange to say his later comedies a word to the wise a school for wives and the man of reason were practically failures and the same is true of his tragedy clementina kelly ultimately withdrew from stage work and for the last three years of his life practiced as a barrister without however achieving much distinction in his new profession charles coffee death seventeen forty five an irishman was the author of several farces operas ballad operas ballad farces and farcical operas the best known of which was the devil to pay or the wives metamorphosed seventeen thirty one henry brook seventeen o three to seventeen eighty three a county caven man and the son of a clergyman was educated at trinity college dublin and afterwards studied law in london becoming guardian to his cousin a girl of twelve he put her to school for two years and then secretly married her of his large family of twenty-two children three of whom were born before their mother was eighteen years old but one survived him appointed by lord chesterfield barrack master at mullingar brooke afterwards settled in county kildare it was there that he wrote his celebrated work the fool of quality or the history of the earl of moreland five volumes seventeen sixty six to seventeen seventy which won the commendations of men so widely different as john wesley and charles kingsley it is indeed a remarkable book combining as it does many of the characteristics of stern mackenzie barrow and george meredith it is not very well known nowadays but it will always bear and will well repay perusal brooke also wrote a poem on universal beauty seventeen thirty five and the tragedies gustavus vasa seventeen thirty nine the production of which was forbidden in london but which was afterwards staged in dublin as the patriot and the earl of essex seventeen forty nine which was played both in london and in dublin and has been made famous by the parody of one line in it by samuel johnson another novel juliet grenville or the history of the human heart published in seventeen seventy four was not nearly up to the standard of the fool of quality brooke was a busy literary man he made a translation of part of tasso drafted plans for a history of ireland projected a series of old irish tales wrote one fragment in a style very like that subsequently adopted by macpherson in his ossian and for a while was editor of the freeman's journal in the beginning brooke was violently anti-catholic but as time progressed he became more liberal-minded and advocated the relaxation of the penal laws and a more humane treatment of his catholic fellow-countrymen 
like swift and steel he fell into a state of mental debility for some years before his death his daughter charlotte brooke 1740 to 1793 deserves mention as a pioneer of the irish literary revival for she devoted herself to the saving of the stores of irish literature which in her time were rapidly disappearing one of the fruits of her labors was the relics of irish poetry published in 1789 she also wrote emma or the foundling of the wood a novel and belisarius a tragedy charles johnstone circa 1719 to 1800 a county limerick man was educated in dublin and called to the english bar but owing to deafness was more successful as a chamber counsel than as a pleader emigrating to india in 1782 he became joint proprietor of a newspaper in calcutta and there he died he wrote several satirical romances such as chrysal or the adventures of a guinea the reverie or a flight to the paradise of fools and the history of arsace prince of betlis of these the first was the best samuel johnson who read it in manuscript advised its publication and his opinion was vindicated for it proved a huge success sir walter scott afterwards said that the author of chrysal deserved to rank as a prose juvenile johnstone also wrote the pilgrim or a picture of life and a picaresque novel the history of john juniper esq alias juniper jack arthur murphy seventeen twenty seven to eighteen o five born at clunquin county roscommon was educated at st omer at first an actor he afterwards studied law and was called to the english bar in seventeen sixty two he made a translation of tacitus and wrote several farces and comedies among which may be mentioned the apprentice the spouter the upholsterer the way to keep him and all in the wrong he also wrote three tragedies namely the orphan of china the grecian daughter and arminius for the last named which was produced in seventeen ninety eight and which had a strongly political cast he received a pension of two hundred pounds a year his plays long held the stage oliver goldsmith seventeen twenty eight to seventeen seventy four essayist poet novelist playwright historian biographer and editor was a many-sided genius who as johnson said in his epitaph left scarcely any kind of writing untouched and touched none that he did not adorn born probably in county longford the son of a poor clergyman he was educated at various country schools until in seventeen forty four he secured a sizarship in trinity college dublin there he had a somewhat stormy career but eventually took his degree in seventeen forty nine he then lounged at home for a while in his widowed mother's cottage at ballymahon until he was persuaded to take orders but spoiled his already sufficiently poor chances of ordination by appearing before the bishop of elphin in scarlet breeches after other adventures in search of a profession he went to edinburgh in seventeen fifty two to study medicine and two years later transferred himself to leyden for the same purpose it was from leyden that with one guinea in his pocket one shirt on his person and a flute in his hand he started on his celebrated walking tour of europe during which he gained those impressions which he afterwards was to embody in some of his greater works in seventeen fifty six he arrived in england where for three years he had very varied experiences as a strolling player an apothecary's journeyman a practicing physician a reader for the press an usher in an academy and a hack writer in seventeen fifty nine he published anonymously his inquiry into the present state of polite learning in europe which was well received and helped him to other literary work the bee a volume of essays and verses appeared in the same year he was made editor of the ladies magazine he published memoirs of voltaire seventeen sixty one a history of mecklenburg seventeen sixty two and a life of richard nash seventeen sixty two in seventeen sixty two also he brought out his citizen of the world a collection of essays which takes an extremely high rank in seventeen sixty four his poem the traveller or a prospect of society made its appearance and in seventeen sixty six he gave to the world his famous novel the vicar of wakefield his reputation as a writer was now established he was received into johnson's circle and was made a member of the literary club reynolds and burke were proud to call him a friend in seventeen sixty eight he had his comedy the good-natured man produced at covent garden theatre where it achieved a fair measure of success and brought him in four hundred pounds in seventeen seventy he repeated his triumph as a poet with the deserted village 
he wrote a history of animated nature a history of england and a history of rome all compilations couched in that easy style of which he was master he also wrote a life of parnell and a life of bolingbroke finally in seventeen seventy three his great comedy she stoops to conquer was staged at covent garden and met with wonderful success a little more than a year later goldsmith died of a nervous fever the result of overwork and anxiety and was buried in the burial ground of the temple church his unfinished poem retaliation a series of epigrams in epitaph form on some of his distinguished literary and artistic friends was issued a few days after his death and added greatly to his reputation as a wit and humorist a reputation which was still further enhanced when in seventeen seventy six the haunch of venison made its appearance in the latter year a monument with a medallion and johnson's celebrated latin epitaph attached was erected to his memory in westminster abbey goldsmith's renown great in his own day has never since diminished his essays his novel and his poems are still read with avidity and pleasure his comedy is still acted it is his statue that stands along with burke's at the entrance gate to trinity college dublin the alma mater seeking to commemorate in a striking manner two of her most distinguished sons by placing their effigies thus in the forefront of her possessions and in full view of all the world personally goldsmith was a very amiable and good-hearted man dear to his own circle and dear to that mr posterity to whom he once addressed a humorous dedication he had his faults it is true but they are hidden amid his many perfections every one will be disposed to agree with what johnson wrote of him let not his frailties be remembered he was a very great man edmund burke seventeen twenty nine to seventeen ninety seven born in dublin the son of a protestant father and a catholic mother whose name was nagel was educated first at a quaker school in ballator county kildare and afterwards at trinity college dublin he became a law student in london but he did not eventually adopt the law as a profession he brought out in seventeen fifty six a vindication of natural society in which he so skilfully imitated the style and the paradoxical reasoning of bolingbroke that many were deceived into the belief that vindication was a posthumously published production of the viscount's pen in the following year burke published in his own name a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful which attracted widespread attention was translated into german and french and brought its author into touch with all the leading literary men of london he was instrumental with dodsley the publisher in starting the annual register in 1759 and for close on thirty years he continued to supply it with the survey of events he entered public life in 1760 by accompanying single speech hamilton to dublin when the latter was appointed chief secretary for ireland in 1765 he was made private secretary to the prime minister the marquis of rockingham and as member for wendover entered parliament where he speedily made a name for himself during lord north's long tenure of office 1770 to 1782 burke was one of the minority and opposed the splendid force of his genius to the corruption extravagance and maladministration of the government to this period belong in addition to lesser works his great speeches on american taxation 1774 and on conciliation with america 1775 as well as his spirited letter to the sheriffs of bristol 1777 he had been elected member of parliament for bristol in 1774 but he lost his seat in 1780 because he had advocated the relaxation of the restrictions on the trade of ireland with great britain and of the penal laws against catholics in the second administration of rockingham 1782 and in that of portland 1783 he was paymaster of the forces a position which he lost on the downfall of the whigs in the latter year and he never again held public office his speech on the impeachment of warring hastings in 1788 is universally and justly ranked as a masterpiece of eloquence when the french revolution broke out he opposed it with might and main his reflections on the french revolution 1790 had an enormous circulation and reached an eleventh edition inside of a year was read all over the continent as well as in the british isles and helped materially not only to keep england steady in the crisis but also to incite the other powers to continue their resistance to french aggression he continued his campaign in thoughts on french affairs and letters on a regicide peace he was given two pensions in 1794 and would have been raised to the peerage as lord beaconsfield had not the succession to the title been cut off by the premature death of his only son 
he himself died in seventeen ninety seven and was buried at beaconsfield where as far back as seventeen sixty eight he had purchased a small estate as an orator and a deep political thinker burke holds a foremost place among those of all time who distinguished themselves in the british parliament his keen intellect his powerful imagination his sympathy with the fallen the downtrodden and the oppressed and his matchless power of utterance of the thoughts that were in him have made an impression that can never be effaced his wise and statesmanlike views on questions affecting the colonies ought to endear him to all americans although if his counsels had been hearkened to it is probable that the separation from the mother country would not have occurred as soon as it did for his native land he used his best endeavors when and how he could and although as her defender he was faced by obloquy as well as by the loss of that parliamentary position which was as dear to him as the breath of his nostrils he did not flinch or shrink from supporting her material and spiritual interests in his own generous manly whole-hearted way trinity college dublin has done well in placing his statue at her outer gates as representing the greatest irishman of his generation a political associate of burke's for many years was richard brinsley sheridan 1751 to 1816 of county cavan descent sheridan was born in dublin and was educated partly in his native city and partly at harrow and the remainder of his life was spent in england he was distinguished first as a playwright and afterwards as a parliamentary orator in seventeen seventy five his comedy the rivals was produced at covent garden theatre his farce st patrick's day or the scheming lieutenant and his comic opera the duenna were staged in the same year his greatest comedy the school for scandal was acted at drury lane theatre in seventeen seventy seven and it was followed in seventeen seventy nine by the critic his last dramatic composition was the tragedy pizarro produced in seventeen ninety nine elected to parliament in seventeen eighty sheridan was made under secretary for foreign affairs in the rockingham administration of seventeen eighty two and in seventeen eighty three he was secretary to the treasury in the coalition ministry he sprang into repute as a brilliant orator during the impeachment of warren hastings seventeen eighty seven to seventeen ninety four his speech on the begums avowed was one of the greatest ever delivered within the walls of the british parliament in eighteen o six on the return of the whigs to power he was appointed treasurer in the navy in 1812 his long parliamentary career came to a close when he was defeated for the borough of westminster he died in 1816 and was honored with a magnificent funeral in westminster abbey to give an idea as to how sheridan's oratorical powers impressed his contemporaries it is perhaps enough to repeat what burke said of his second speech against warren hastings namely that it was the most astonishing effort of eloquence argument and wit united of which there is any record or tradition and to add that when after three hours of impassioned pleading he brought his first speech against hastings to an end the effect produced was so great that it was agreed to adjourn the house immediately and defer the final decision until the members should be in a less excited mood as a dramatist sheridan is second in popularity to shakespeare alone the school for scandal and the rivals are as fresh and as eagerly welcomed to-day as they were a hundred and forty years ago like burke he was true to the land of his birth and his oppressed catholic fellow-countrymen almost his last words in the house of commons were these be just to ireland i will never give my vote to any administration that opposes the question of catholic emancipation sheridan belonged to a family that was exceptionally distinguished in english literature among those who preceded him as literateurs were his grandfather the rev thomas sheridan d d his father thomas sheridan and his mother francis sheridan rev dr sheridan sixteen eighty four to seventeen thirty eight the friend and confidant of dean swift kept a fashionable school in dublin edited the satires of perseus in seventeen twenty eight wrote a treatise on the art of punning and figures largely in swift's correspondence thomas sheridan seventeen twenty one to seventeen eighty eight was at first an actor of considerable reputation both in dublin and in london was next a teacher of elocution and finally came forward with an improved system of education in which oratory was to have a conspicuous part in this connection he published an elaborate plan of education in seventeen sixty nine but his ideas some of which are in accord with modern practice were not taken up he also compiled a pronouncing dictionary of the english language with a prosodic grammar and in seventeen eighty four published an entertaining life of swift francis sheridan seventeen twenty four to seventeen sixty six wife of thomas and mother of richard brinsley 
who as francis chamberlain had been known as a poetess wrote after her marriage two plays the discovery and the droop and two novels the memoirs of miss sydney biddulph which was a great success and was translated by the abbe prevost into french and the history of nour jihad an oriental tale in seventeen seventy five the singular spectacle was presented of the son's play running at covent garden while the mother's was being acted at drury lane among sheridan's descendants who earned a niche in the temple of literary fame were his granddaughters the countess of dufferin eighteen o seven to eighteen sixty seven and the honorable mrs norton afterwards lady sterling maxwell eighteen o eight to eighteen seventy seven and his great-grandson the first marquis of dufferin and ava eighteen twenty six to nineteen o two lady dufferin's lament of the irish emigrant i'm sitting on the stile mary has moved the hearts and brought tears to the eyes of countless thousands since it was published more than fifty years ago sir philip francis seventeen forty to eighteen eighty born in dublin was the son of a clergyman of like name who attained some literary eminence as the translator of horace and as a political writer after filling various important government positions philip francis the son was in seventeen seventy three made a member of the council of bengal where his relations with the governor-general warren hastings were of an extremely strained character amounting at times almost to a public scandal he returned to england in seventeen eighty one entered parliament made a name as a speaker took part in the impeachment of hastings and composed numerous political pamphlets he is generally supposed to have been the writer of the celebrated letters of junius which appeared at intervals in the public advertiser between january twenty first seventeen sixty nine and january twenty first seventeen seventy two these letters are distinguished for their polished style their power of invective their galling sarcasm their knowledge of state secrets and their unparalleled boldness every prominent man connected with the government was attacked even the king himself was not spared as revised by their pseudonymous writer in a reprint made in seventeen seventy two they number seventy a later edition in eighteen twelve contained one hundred thirteen more their authorship has been the subject of much controversy nor is the question yet finally settled in his essay on warren hastings written in eighteen forty one macaulay went to considerable trouble to prove by the cumulative method that francis was the writer and since then that opinion has been generally but not universally maintained isaac bickerstaff circa seventeen thirty five to circa eighteen twelve was an irishman whose name strange to say had no connection with the nom de guerre of the same style under which swift had masqueraded in his outrageously satirical acts on partridge the almanac maker or with the more celebratory imaginary isaac bickerstaff under cover of whose personality steele conducted the tattler the real bickerstaff was a prolific playwright his best-known pieces are the sultan the maid of the mill lionel and carissa and love in a village in the last mentioned occurs the famous song beginning we all love a pretty girl under the rose william drennan seventeen fifty four to eighteen twenty who has been called the tertius of the united irishmen was the son of a presbyterian clergyman was born in belfast and was educated at glasgow and edinburgh universities taking a medical degree from the latter he practiced his profession in the north of ireland when the irish volunteers were established drennan entered heart and soul into the movement removing to dublin in seventeen eighty nine he associated with tone and other revolutionary spirits and became one of the founders of the society of united irishmen the first statement of whose objects was the product of his pen his letters of oriana helped materially to enlist the men of ulster in the ranks of the society he also wrote a series of stirring lyrics which voicing as they did the general sentiment in ireland at the time became extremely popular and had a widespread effect these were afterwards eighteen fifteen collected under the title of fugitive pieces all his political hopes being blasted with the failure of the rebellion of seventeen ninety eight and of emmet's insurrection in eighteen o three drennan returned in eighteen o seven to belfast and there founded the belfast magazine the wake of william orr a series of noble and affecting stanzas commemorating the judicial murder of a young presbyterian irish patriot in seventeen ninety eight is one of his best-known pieces he also celebrated the ill-fated brothers shears his song aaron was considered by moore to be one of the most perfect of modern songs it was in this piece that he fixed upon ireland the title of the emerald isle 
when aaron first rose from the dark swelling flood god blessed the green island and saw it was good the emerald of europe it sparkled and shone in the ring of the world the most precious stone mary tiggy seventeen seventy two to eighteen ten whose maiden name was blashford was born the daughter of a clergyman in county wicklow she contracted an unhappy marriage with her cousin who represented kilkenny in the irish house of commons by all accounts she was of great beauty and numerous accomplishments she wrote many poems her best and best known is psyche or the legend of love an adaptation of the story of cupid and psyche from the golden ass of epileus the meter she employed in this piece was the spenserian stanza which she handled with great power freedom and melody psyche which first appeared in seventeen ninety five had a wonderful vogue running rapidly through edition after edition among others to whom it appealed and who were influenced by it was keats mrs tiggy's talent drew from moore a delicate compliment in tell me the witching tale again and in the grave of a poetess and i stood where the life of song lay low mrs hemans bewailed her untimely death edmund malone 1741 to 1813 the son of an irish judge was born in dublin and studied at trinity college he was called to the irish bar in 1767 but coming into a fortune he abandoned his profession and gave himself over to literary work in 1790 he brought out an edition of shakespeare which was deservedly praised for its learning and research his critical acumen led him to doubt the genuineness of chatterton's rowley poems and he was one of the first to expose ireland's shakespearean forgeries in seventeen ninety six among other services to literature he wrote a life of sir joshua reynolds and edited dryden he also left a quantity of materials afterwards utilized for the variorum shakespeare by james boswell the younger in eighteen twenty one john o'keefe seventeen forty seven to eighteen thirty three a dublin man was at first an art student but soon became an actor and then developed into a playwright his pen was most prolific he published a collection of over fifty pieces in seventeen ninety eight his plays are mostly comic operas or farces and some of them had great success lingo the schoolmaster in the agreeable surprise is a very amusing character the positive man the son-in-law wild oats love in a camp and the poor soldier are among his compositions his songs are well known such as i am a friar of orders gray and there are few schoolboys who have not sooner or later made the acquaintance of his amo amas i loved alas for the last fifty-two years of his life o'keefe was blind an affliction which he bore with unfailing cheerfulness in eighteen twenty six he was given a pension of one hundred guineas a year from the king's privy purse george canning seventeen seventy to eighteen twenty seven prime minister of england properly belongs here for although born in london he was a member of an irish family long settled at garva and county derry entering parliament on the side of pitt in seventeen ninety six he was made secretary of the navy in eighteen o four and in eighteen twelve secretary of state for foreign affairs he became prime minister in eighteen twenty seven but died within six months leaving a record for scarcely surpassed eloquence in addition to his speeches he is known in literature for his contributions to the anti-jacobin or weekly examiner which ran its satirical and energetic career for eight months november seventeen ninety seven to july seventeen ninety eight some of the best things that appeared in this ultra-conservative organ were from canning's pen few there are who have not laughed at his loves of the triangles in which he caricatured erasmus darwin's loves of the plants at the needy knife grinder or at the song of rogero in the rovers with its comic refrain of the university of gottingen like most of the great anglo-irishmen of his time canning favored catholic emancipation it is interesting to note that it was a letter of canning's that led to the formulation of the monroe doctrine henry grattan seventeen forty six to eighteen twenty the hero of grattan's parliament was born in dublin and studied at trinity college his history belongs to that of his country suffice it here to say that not only did he by great eloquence and real statesmanship secure a free parliament for ireland in seventeen eighty two but also that he fought energetically if unavailingly against the abolition of that parliament in eighteen hundred and that thenceforward he devoted his abilities to promoting the cause of catholic emancipation dying in london he was honored by being buried in westminster abbey in an age of great orators he stands out among the very foremost his speeches have become classics and are constantly quoted 
another brilliant irish orator as well as an eminent wit of this period was john philpot curran 1750 to 1817 who born at newmarket county cork and educated at trinity college dublin achieved a wonderful success at the irish bar he defended with rare insight eloquence and patriotism those who were accused of complicity in the rebellion of seventeen ninety eight as a member of grattan's parliament he voiced the most liberal principles and though a protestant himself he worked hard in the catholic cause he held the great office of master of the rolls in ireland from eighteen o six to eighteen fourteen the memory of few irish orators wits or patriots is greener to-day than that of curran his daughter Sarah, whose fate is so inextricably blended with that of the ill-starred Robert Emmet, has been rendered immortal by Moore in his beautiful song, She is far from the land where her young hero sleeps. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, 1759-1797, to the first advocate of the rights of women, though born in London, was of Irish extraction. Into the details of her extraordinary and checkered career it is not possible or necessary here to enter. Her published works include Thoughts on the Education of Daughters, 1787, Answer to Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution, 1791, Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792, and An Unfinished Historical and Moral View of the French Revolution, Volume 1, 1794. Having in August 1797 born to her husband William Godwin, a daughter who afterwards became Shelley's second wife, Mary Godwin died in the following month whatever her faults and they were perhaps not greater than her misfortunes she had something of the divine touch of genius and in a different environment might easily have left some great literary memento which the world would not willingly let die maria edgeworth seventeen sixty seven to eighteen forty nine though born at blackborton in england belonged to a family which had settled in different parts of ireland and finally at edgeworth's town county longford for nearly two hundred years she was the daughter of Richard Lovell Edgeworth, 1744 to 1817, who was distinguished for his inventions, for his eccentricity, and for his varied matrimonial experiences, and who himself figures in literature as the author of memoirs, posthumously published in 1820, and as the partner with his daughter in Practical Education, 1798, and in an essay on Irish Bulls, 1802. Maria had a busy literary career and was before the public for 52 years from 1795 to 1847. She wrote moral tales, popular tales, tales from fashionable life, and Harrington, but she is now best remembered for her three masterpieces dealing with Irish life and conditions, namely Castle Rackrent, 1800, The Absentee, 1812, and Ormond, 1817. By these works she inspired Scott, as he himself tells us, to attempt for his own country something of the same kind with that which she had so fortunately achieved for Ireland, and in a later day she inspired Turgenev to do similarly for Russia. She excels in wit and pathos and gives a true and vivid presentation of the times and conditions as she viewed them. Andrew Cherry, 1763 to 1821, born in Limerick, became an actor, a theatrical manager, and a playwright he wrote nine or ten plays several of which were moderately successful the one that is now remembered is the soldier's daughter some of his songs such as the bay of biscay tom moody the whipper in and especially the green little shamrock of ireland bid fair to be immortal other irish songwriters were thomas duffett living sixteen seventy six author of come all you pale lovers arthur dawson 1700 to 1775 author of bumpers squire jones george ogle 1742 to 1814 author of molly ashthor richard alfred milliken 1767 to 1815 author of the grotesque groves of blarney edward lycett 1763 to 1811 author of our ireland the gallant man who led the van of the irish volunteers and Kate of Garnavia. George Nugent Reynolds, 1770 to 1802, author of Kathleen O'More. Thomas Dermody, 1775 to 1802, author of the collection of poems and songs known as the Harp of Aaron. James Orr, 1770 to 1816, author of The Irishman. Henry Barreton Code, 
died 1830, author of The Sprig of Shillelagh. Charles Wolfe, 1791 to 1893, author of If I Had Thought Thou Couldst Have Died, and of The Burial of Sir John Moore. And Charles Dawson Shanley, 1811 to 1875, author of Kitty of Colrain. Theobald Wolfe Tone, 1763 to 1798, born in Dublin, educated at Trinity College, and called to the Irish Bar in 1789, fills a large space in the history of his country from 1790 to his death in 1798. Intrepid, daring, and resourceful, he was one of the most dangerous of the enemies to English domination in Ireland that arose at any time during the troubled relations between the two countries. Taken prisoner on board a French ship of the line bound for Ireland on a mission of freedom, he committed suicide in prison rather than submit to the ignominy of being hanged to which he had been condemned. He sleeps his last sleep in Bowdenstown churchyard, in that county of Kildare to which he was connected by many ties. His grave is still the mecca of many a pilgrimage, and the cornerstone of a statue to his memory has been laid for some years on a commanding site in the city of his birth. He is known in literature for his journals and his autobiography, both containing sad but inspiring reading for the Irishman of today. Here this rapid survey of Irish writers of English must close. To tell in any sort of appropriate detail the story of the English literature of Ireland in the 19th and 20th centuries would require a separate volume, a volume which is now under way and will, it is hoped, be speedily forthcoming. There is all the less need to attempt the agreeable task here, because in other portions of this book much more than passing reference is made to the chief Irish authors who, in the last hundred and fifteen years, have distinguished themselves and shed luster on their country. During that period, Irish poets, playwrights, novelists, essayists, historians, biographers, humorists, critics, and scholars have fully held their own, both in the quantity and the quality of the work produced, and have left an impression of power and personality, of graceful style and vivifying imagination, that in itself constitutes, and must forever constitute, one of the distinctive glories of Ireland. References Irish Literature, 10 Volumes, New York, 1904 Chambers's Cyclopedia of English Literature, three volumes, Philadelphia and London, 1902 to 1904. Dictionary of National Biography, Encyclopedia Britannica, Cambridge History of English Literature, Dalton History of Ireland, London, 1910. Lennox Early Printing in Ireland, Washington, 1909. Addison and the Modern Essay, Washington, 1912. Lessons in English Literature, 21st edition, Baltimore, 1913. Macaulay, Essays, History of England. Brown, A Reader's Guide to Irish Fiction, London, 1910. A Guide to Books on Ireland, Dublin, 1912. End of Section 38 End of the Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox